Uh, and I've got recording, there we go. So um, my name is Marianne Haverhill. I'm the chair of this committee and a member of the Economic Alliance Board of Directors. I'm so glad that all of you could come. Um, I am also the chair of the Community Foundation of the Valleys Board and otherwise active in uh, various uh, community organizations and so on. So do we have time, um, Sonia, to quickly do some introductions? We're gonna, we're gonna introduce Ken and Morgan in just a moment, so we won't do them, but maybe the others quickly, we could just tell us tell where we are from so that um, our guest speakers will know who, who is being represented in our group, if that's okay. So just your name, and if you have a title and your organization would be great. And Elizabeth, you're next to me on, the, on my screen, so you wanna start? Sure, uh, good morning, I'm Elizabeth DeCretere. I am Director of Industry and Community Relations with Southland Regional Association of Realtors. We have about 10,000 members representing in the uh, San Fernando and Santa Clarita Valleys. Great. Um, let me see, we, Sonia, um, we've kind of introduced you already as our CEO. Maybe you'll have a welcome in just a moment, but we'll get back to you. Um, Jaime? Hey, how's it going? Good morning, everyone. My name is Jaime Del Rio, and I'm with Abundant House in LA. Great. Oh, uh, I was going to call him Audrey, but I guess she'll come back in a moment. How about Ray? Everyone, my name is uh, oh, uh, my name is Ray Peltier. I am an um, uh, architect uh, uh, with Peltier Architects, working in Southern California. Thank you. Great. And Vahid. Good morning, uh, Vahid Korsan from Councilmember Bob Lubinfield's office. Terrific, Audrey. Hi, I'm Audrey Simons, um, Chief Executive Officer of San Fernando Community Health Center. We are a federally qualified health center in serving the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Great. Um, Erica? Oh, oh, you're- Thank you, right. Erica Gass with the Valley Economic Alliance. Great, longtime staff member who we all know and love. <laughs> uh, Roz? Oh, muted. It doesn't look like you're muted, but I can't, I can't hear you at least. Uh, can others hear you? Hmm, well, okay, <laughs> maybe we'll come back to you. Uh, Patricia. Good morning, I'm Patricia Chambers. I'm an administrator in the office of the superintendent for Los Angeles Unified School District. And you're like, why is she here? Well, housing continues to be a struggle <laughs> for teachers because they don't make a lot of money. And then I'm just also wanna hear about these little tiny homes. Yeah, great, good. Well, glad to have you, Patricia. Jackie. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good to see everyone. I'm Jackie Matsumoto with the Valley Economic Alliance. I'm Director of Investor Relations. Another longtime uh, Alliance staff member who we love. Um, Jeffrey or Jeff? Uh, I'm Jeffrey Hartso. I'm the president of Sherman Oaks Neighborhood Council, and I applaud what the Alliance does, and I thought I should learn more about it. Thank you. Great. Good. Jenny? Hi, good morning, everyone. Jenny Portillo, Deputy District Director for Council Member Bob Blumenfield. Terrific, welcome. Azumi? Good morning. My name is Izumi Tanaka. I am representing a Latitude Regenerative Real Estate Broker by EXP. I'm a green agent. Great. And then William? Uh, Bill Jaros from Zucker Productions, do video production and uh, poker videos. Yes, you have helped us with our Housing Creates Community campaign. Thank you. Uh, Claudia. Uh -huh. <laughs> Claudia. Good morning, everyone. I'm Claudia Dunn Martinez with UCLA Health. I do um, community marketing and outreach for our areas that cover Santa Clarita, the North San Fernando Valley, uh, Simi Valley, and downtown Los Angeles. Thank you. Great. All right, um, Martha, um, if it's okay, Martha has to leave a little bit early, but she's, we had planned to talk about our Housing Creates Community Campaigns and she has a brief update to share. So why don't you tell us who you are, who you represent, and then um, what you've been working on. Got to unmute. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Martha Diaz Ashkenazi. I'm the publisher of the San Fernando Valley Sun and the vice president of Ashkenazi Development Inc., both headquartered in the city of San Fernando. And I am a board member and past chair of the Valley Economic Alliance. And so I'm thrilled to be helping with this project with everybody that's here. Um, our Housing Creates Communities 
has a banner campaign and we're asking um, the cities that are our partners to um, you know, support it. And so I reached out to the city of San Fernando and um, their, man their city manager has agreed to um, you know, create and, and uh, put banners up once the city council has approved in March, it has to go before that. He doesn't see a problem with that. And so he's, he's on board. Um, he says this will help him with his um, requirements to the state of California. And so um, he was very happy um, to be on board. There was some little changes, I think, that were made to the campaign that um, met with his satisfaction, I believe. And he just needs to now go to the um, city uh, um, council. So next, I'm going to call the city of Glendale and hopefully have some positive results also to report. Well, now that you have good success with San Fernando, that may help with Glendale. You can put a little pressure on him. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much. And keep us posted on how it goes with the San Fernando City Council. I can't imagine they would oppose something like this, but we'll see. It's coming for a vote in March. So okay. um, it's the, they meet the first week in March. And so hopefully, you know, I'll have something to report. Great. All right. A few more people have joined us. Um, let me see. Louise? Hi. Yeah, I had quite a challenge getting in. So. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it was a little hard to find the passcode, but anyway, welcome. Just your name and who you represent. Um, Louise Oliver, I'm with Goodwill Southern California in Panorama City. Great, okay. And then I think Fred just joined us a moment ago. Do you wanna tell us who you are? Most of us know, but you can always tell us again. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Fred Gaines with the Law Offices of Gaines and Stacey, and I'm chair of the Board of the Valley Economic Alliance. And thank you all for joining us today and uh, for all your good work for the Alliance. Great. And then Roz- Home of the you... world champion, Super Bowl champion, Los Angeles. <laughs> my, my daughter goes to USC and um, she lives on campus. And I guess they they basically closed down yesterday morning for the for the victory parade. So she got she sent us pictures. She was there. So that was kind of fun. She's a big football fan. So anyway, and those those fireworks that you saw on uh, Sunday after the game in the in Woodland Hills. If you were anywhere in the area, we had a large firework display. That was uh, courtesy of the Los Angeles Rams, uh, shot off from the Westfield uh, parking lot. So oh, fun! Oh, that's great. Well, good to know. Um, all right, so Roz, are, can we hear you now? Oh, let's see, are you still with us? Yes. Oh, still can't hear you. Okay. Hmm. Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here. <laughs> all right, I think I see that Dan Blake joined us. Can you just give us your name, Dan, and who you represent? Yes, if I can start it all. Uh, sorry. Uh, Daniel Blake, California State University, Northridge. I conduct so you can see it. Yeah. Yes. Great. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, Sonia, I, I, did you want to do a welcome before you may need to kind of duck out for a few minutes? Or yes. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you very much, and welcome everyone. Thank you, Marianne and Fred, the whole board members that are here, and our committee members for the wonderful work that's being done. I just want to. I add my welcome to Mary Ann's welcome to the Valley Economic Alliance's Livable and Sustainable Communities Committee meeting. Um, do feel free to add your contact information in the chat. If you see some folks you want to be able to network a little bit and be in touch with people afterwards, we definitely love to be conveners and have people continue the conversations even after this wonderful call. This is one of four active committees um, that are advancing great work for the Alliance. The others are economic development, education and workforce development, and diversity committee. So if any of those topics also interest you, I encourage you to attend those meetings as well. You'll find info about each of our meetings at thevalley.net slash events. And maybe Erica, if you could put that in the chat, thevalley.net slash events. As some of you may know, and I love uh, that uh, Jeffrey mentioned he wanted to learn more about the Alliance. The Alliance is a nonprofit organization founded in 1994 by many Valley leaders. And since that time, we have been helping residents and employers to thrive ever since. Um, we help employers grow, increase revenues, decrease expenses, leverage real estate, find qualified employees in order to really help create jobs and boost our local economy. 
So if you are an employer and you're poised to create new jobs, see how we can help. I'll pop my email in the chat so that you can connect with us offline and we can see how we can help. If you know of companies that are struggling, you know, these are still sometimes difficult times for uh, companies during the pandemic. If you know of companies that are struggling, I encourage you to let them know about our business assistance program. And I'll pop uh, some information in the chat about that as well. Uh, I just want to thank um, our speakers today, both of whom I just very much admire and are such friends to the Alliance. Thank you so much for being with us. And with that, I want to send it back to our capable and amazing uh, chair, Marianne Haverhill. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. Wow. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. Well, um, also just in the chat, thank you, Roz, for your comments. And just in case you haven't seen it, uh, Roz Lowe, whose sound wasn't working, uh, is from LA Gage in Sun Valley, which they're a defense contractor interested in coming alongside the community. Great. We're glad you're with us. All right. So I'm so pleased that we have our guest uh, speakers today. Um, Ken Kraft has been a longtime friend of mine and certainly a friend of our community. Um, Ken serves as the Chief Executive Officer of the Hope of the Valley Rescue Mission, which he founded in 2009. He now manages a staff of over 330 individuals who in turn manage house, housing operations, provide social services, and operate five thrift shops. Ken, I remember when you started, you're, you've kind of grown a lot. It's awesome. Okay, under his leadership, the organization has become a leading provider of housing and homeless services in the state of California. Ken is an entrepreneurial leader who has dedicated his life to addressing the humanitarian crisis of homelessness. Implementing a holistic approach to programming, outreach, and services, Ken has leveraged his knowledge, passion, and talents to build an organization that currently consists of 16 housing facilities with 1,532 beds between them. In total, Hope of the Valley has 23 site locations scattered across the greater Los Angeles area. So thank you, Ken, for joining us. We look forward to hearing your comments today about um, the tiny homes um, uh, program, as well as other things that you might want to talk about in the time that we've um, set aside for you. Great, thank you. Uh, and then do you want me to speak now or are you- Sure, yes, go ahead. Yeah, and we'll introduce Morgan after you finish. So okay. we'll give you some time and some Q&A and then we'll get to Morgan and we'll introduce her then. Okay, sounds good. Well, thank you for allowing me to, to share for a few moments. And, you know, one of the things I, I know, and that is if you live in Los Angeles, you're aware of the homeless challenge that, that we as a city face. And it's certainly not unique to our city. Um, there's this real challenge of, of homelessness and, and people become homeless for many different reasons. And uh, I will say this, you know, when you read the papers, you watch the news, you see a lot of criticism um, towards politicians, criticism that the city's not doing enough and we should do more. Um, you know, I, I'm on the inside. I see what's going on and I am really proud to live in this city. I am really proud of the efforts that our politicians are making um, and the policies that have been established. Uh, I think if people could see behind the curtain a little bit and see the numbers of projects that are in the queue, the amount of resources that's being um, poured into this, this um, humanitarian crisis, I think it would do us all good. Um, you know, I, I read, uh, you know, Caruso's, uh, um, it's Caruso, uh, he's running for mayor. Um, he has his homeless plan, which is really good. I mean, he had some really good stuff in there. Um, but unfortunately, it also, you know, it kind of demonizes those that are already been working on it and the existing, you know, the, the politicians. And, and so I just don't think that's necessary. I think we need to really celebrate the, the incredible progress that's been made. And uh, one of the things that's been a really kind of a game changer that's turned things around has been these tiny homes. And uh, you might say, you know, what are they? Well, first of all, they're, they're 64 square foot houses. Uh, and when you would look at them, they're, they're very small, uh, but there are two beds inside of them. There are three electrical outlets. There's four windows. Uh, there's storage space underneath. Uh, there's smoke detectors. And most importantly, there's a front door that locks. And how did this come about? If you indulge me for just a moment, you know, let me go backwards, because in 2016, most of us remember that there was a bond measure that was approved by the uh, taxpayers here in Los Angeles. Remember, it was Triple H, and it was $1.2 billion. And we all said, yes, we're going to build enough affordable and permanent and supportive housing, and we're going to end this homeless crisis. Well, the first affordable housing complex did not open until 2020. 
So it passed in 2016. The first one didn't open until 2020. And, you know, that's, that's really demoralizing and discouraging. Can you imagine being an outreach worker and you go to an encampment and say, listen, have I got good news for you? We just passed a bond measure. We're going to create some affordable housing for you. Just hang in there for the next four years on the streets until we can get this built. Uh, I mean, that, that doesn't give a whole lot of hope. And so Mayor Eric Garcetti did something in 2018 for which I am eternally indebted to him and grateful for. He declared a shelter emergency. Should we have declared one earlier? I think so, but that's water under the bridge. He declared a shelter emergency. That really changed the landscape. Why? Because historically, organizations like Hope of the Valley, we could only open up shelters in zoning that was C2 or CM by right, okay? Um, and when he declared the shelter emergency, now we can be in C2, CM, M1, M2. It opens up a whole other um, genre of classification of buildings, these manufacturing buildings that are at a lower cost, and, and they're more prevalent. Also, historically, we could only have 30 beds or less by right, unless you get a conditional use permit. But that means you have to have public hearings. Everybody comes out. I've actually had death threats at public hearings. You know, people threatening me, if you open this in my area, I'll kill you. I, I, I am not kidding you. And so that became a real deterrent. So the existing policy did not allow for any type of a solution that could be scalable. And so when the mayor declared this shelter emergency, I'm like, wow, this is incredible. Now we have a broadening of the zoning and that 30 bed limit, that cap, it's gone. So we've been able to open up sites that have 230 beds, 215 beds, 175 beds because of that. And the last benefit of this uh, emergency declaration is that the city of Los Angeles can open up shelters in any zoning as long as, number one, either they own the land or, number two, they lease the land. So that in and of itself really changed everything. And I know for me, I, I was actually, you know, these tiny homes, I was working with the University of Southern California uh, in their architectural and engineering division. We had come up with the tiny home prototype that was actually at one of our sites in Van Nuys. And I thought, okay, we're making progress. We got to get this license through the states. And about that time, I got a phone call from Councilman Paul Krikorian's office, Ms. Chief of Staff, who said, have you ever heard of this organization called Pallet Shelter? I know you're interested in these tiny homes. And I said, uh, no. And I looked them up. They're out of Seattle, Washington. I mean, they were miles ahead of us. All right. They had already, they had this design. It's made out of this fiberglass. It's lightweight. It can be installed in one hour. That's how quickly you can assemble these together. Talk about a rapid response to a humanitarian crisis. No longer are we talking a three, four year period sometimes to get permanent supportive housing up, this can be done quickly. And so and I am so thankful, again, for the leadership of uh, many of the council members, you know, Councilman Paul Krikorian, you know, so thankful. He was one of the first ones that said, I want this, I need this in my council district. And he pioneered and he pushed through. And the very first tiny home community was open on Chandler Boulevard. Um, and it was a year ago in February. Okay, that's how soon it was, only a year ago in February. And, uh, and then from there, the next one was Alexandria Park, which was the largest one. And then Councilman Bob Blumenfield said, listen, I need these in my district. And we were able to partner with him and, and get open the, the ones in, in Reseda behind his offices and the ones on Topham Street. Uh, and then another one in Councilman Krikorian's district. And then one in Kevin De Leon's district off of the 110 freeway. And in total, and this could have never, ever happened without the city of Los Angeles. The city of Los Angeles, they designed them, they funded them, they built them, they got the CEO, the CFO, and then they said, Hope of the Valley, do what you do. Get in there, run those, and help people get them off the streets and move them into permanent housing. And so that has been the journey. And uh, I got to tell you, when people come in and they see those tiny homes and you've been living on the streets, you know, and you realize, I mean, I've got air conditioning and I've got heat. I've got a, a, a bed to sleep in. I get three meals a day. I have showers, there's hygiene trailers, there's clothes, there's a, a dog run. I can bring my pet with me as well. Um, there's job training, job placement, mental health services, substance use treatment. I mean, when someone gets into one of these tiny home facilities, it's like winning the lottery. Okay, your next stop is permanent housing. And I'm gonna tell you why that's so important. Last month, myself and our CFO, we did something a little unorthodox. Um, we, 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 we did something we called it from the C-suite to the streets. 
okay? Because I'm the CEO and he's a CFO. So we're gonna go from the C-suite to the streets. We lived 100 hours unsheltered on the streets of Los Angeles. And it was quite an experience. And one of the criteria in order for this to really go well was I had to give up control. And so there are the gentleman who's the director for um, intervention. Uh, it's a show on, on drugs and alcohol. He said, I'll, I'll document this process, but Ken, you got to take your hands off of it. And I don't really like doing that, but I did. And so we already had the date when we were going to start these 100 hours. It was from, from Monday through a Friday. And I mean, and I'm watching the weather on my phone and it's like this massive Pacific storms coming in. And I'm thinking, well, at least put us out there at three o'clock so I can make provisions for the night. Nope, they waited till it was seven o'clock at night. It had already started raining and they dropped us off in Granada Hills with nothing but $5 and the clothes on our back. We had no sleeping bags, no tents and, and we were immediately getting wet. And so I knew we got to get, we got to have shelter. So we ran and we ended up sleeping underneath the freeway off the San Fernando Mission Road and the 118 freeway. And the truth of the matter is it was illegal because you're not supposed to sleep there. But the stone had, there'd already been a cut in the fence. And come to think of it, every night I slept illegally because there was no place to sleep legally. And, and so we experienced this whole challenge. I, I almost tapped out the next morning because I was freezing cold all night. I was doing jumping jacks, maybe slept 40 minutes. Okay. And then trying to, that I finally got a cup of coffee. I spent half of my $5 on that one cup of coffee. It will forever be the greatest cup of coffee I've ever had in my life, okay, at a donut shop. And it, it warmed me back up and I could start to think clearly and kind of devise a strategy. How am I gonna survive? And I'll tell you, those 100 hours was all about survival. How do I survive? If somebody should, would have said, Ken, you should have been working. Are you kidding me? I couldn't work. I was thinking about what am I gonna eat next? Where am I going to sleep next? How am I going to make provisions for this next night? Because it's going to be in the, in the upper 30s. And so, and that's what we see when people are living on the streets. They're surviving. They're not, they're not moving forward. They're barely getting by. Not only are they surviving, they're usually digressing. And, and so we actually did a mental health test before and after those 100 hours and, and with a professional. And, and just our cognitive um, state of well-being declined in just those 100 hours. So when someone, someone would say to me, so what was your takeaway from those 100 hours on the streets? And I say that it's nearly impossible to stay sober, sane, and safe living on the streets. I mean, it was at times terrifying. And you have no walls around you. You have no roof over you. You have no lock. You are exposed. One night, a gentleman, a good Samaritan, okay, I'm half asleep, but you can't really sleep because you're not certain what's going to happen. A good Samaritan is standing over me at 2 a.m. and says, excuse me. And I screamed like I've never screamed. This, this, I didn't know who he was. And he goes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just have a blanket. And I'm like, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can just put it right there. I mean, it took 90 minutes for my heart rate to go back down because of just the uncertainty. We had kids that were throwing lemons at us, you know, because we were, we were exposed. And, but in the midst of all of that and each night trying to survive and, and we have a whole documentary if you just go to hopeofthevalley.org forward slash um, hope wins you can see it. it and it's it's very enlightening but i realize that we cannot allow the streets to be the waiting room for permanent and supportive housing we can't it's cruel and it's inhumane. We've got to bring people indoors. And once we bring them indoors, then we can begin to address the underlying issues that led to their homelessness and that might be preventing them from being housed and employed. And so it is so important. And so these tiny homes, you know, they, from beginning to end, these first six that were opened and now there's other ones being, being opened, 90 day process a 90 day process to erect these tiny homes. And if you were to talk to people that live in these tiny homes, uh, they have nothing but great things to say about them. The fact that they're safe, they're secure, they're warm, they're dry, they're rot resistance, they can withstand winds of actually up to 90 miles an hour. Um, it can be freezing temperatures or it could be 112 degrees and you can keep a temperature between 65 and 75 degrees inside of these tiny homes. And so, 
they really have been a game changer right here in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and, and I know there's other ones that are now getting ready to be opened as well. And so for, for Hope of the Valley, last year we opened six of these sites. Um, right now, we are in escrow on four hotels uh, with Project Home Key 2.0. Uh, and these are mostly for families. Uh, you know, the, the tiny homes have all been for single adults, desperately needed. But we also need more sites for families, for interim housing. And so there's four hotels that we're uh, in escrow on right now. We'll hear in the next 30 days if the state has accepted our joint application with the County of Los Angeles. And so uh, I'm an optimist. Uh, you know, I, I'm a realist. But I see what's going on, and I see, the, again, the numbers of projects, and I see that almost on a daily basis, we're moving people into permanent housing. Every day, we're getting people jobs, and that's how we get it done. We've got to get people off the streets. We've got to get them jobs. We've got to address the underlying issues. And as we do, we begin to see progress. Uh, one of the highlights of my last year was, and I'll be done with this, my, my highlight of this last year was when we opened up the tiny home communities at Whitsitt and Satakoy Street. And Councilman Paul Krikorian proudly proclaimed, he said, I now have beds for everybody that is street homeless in my council district. First person who could say that. And I'm telling you, I'm so thankful for that because yes, now there can be compassionate enforcement and, and we need to clean up our streets. We need to clean up our parks. We need to create a win-win-win situation. I am done. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, talk about a passionate presentation. Thank you so much, Ken. All right, so good work being done. Um, I'd like to open it up now for some questions from our group. Ah, yes, Fred. So, Ken, you know, what, what you're doing is, it's really miraculous and it's God's work and we're, everyone is so appreciative. So tell me why, when I think that it's, it's, it's not enough in terms of the numbers, why I'm wrong, okay? Why, why you're telling me the city of LA is doing amazing things and certainly they're doing a lot more than they did a year ago, two years ago, five years ago. But the fact that there are still however many thousands of people sleeping on the street every night, um, in most, I, I'll say this, I think in most Angelino's minds is a failure, okay? So how do we get from the hundreds or thousand or a couple thousand unit, you know, beds that we've created to the, to a place where nobody is sleeping on the street. Okay. Now, you know, Councilman Kikorian says he now has a bed for everyone. Theoretically, if you have a bed for everyone, then no one has to sleep on the street and we can actually under the law have people sleep in a bed. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't, I don't know if he's actually at that point in his district or not, but I hope he is. But we certainly are not as a city. And we're still, I believe, from what I read, tens of thousands of beds away from that. Yeah. So why is, you know, how do we, how do, we do that? I mean, it, it, you know, it, at, at the pace you're going, which is fantastic, we're still years and years away from there. Mm -hmm. And I think many people will look at that. Um, Many people will agree with Rick Caruso that that's not that that's not a success. Uh, uh, what you're doing is a wild success, but it's not a success as a city. Am am I wrong? Am I where where where? How you know? Are we going to be there in a year, two years? I mean, it's a long time. Yeah, and, and I think Fred, you're absolutely right. Uh, um, are we doing what we need to be doing? Yes. Do we need to do more of it? Yes. Um, I mean, we have to scale this. Uh, I think there's been some really good examples of what can be done, but you bring up the, the, the glaring reality is we must do more. And so, you know, I, I think, and, and my, um, my statement is not, you know, that we're not, I mean, we have to do more. It's not that we're not doing something. We are doing something that has to be done, but we have to be able to um, do much more. And one of the examples I give is if, if there was an earthquake tonight and, and all, you had all these buildings that were destroyed and, and, you know, FEMA would make sure that the National Guard was here and the Red Cross was here and, and there would be this, this emergency response to make sure that people didn't have to sleep outside. Um, you know, I don't think we've seen that level of response. 
Um, I guess because I've been in this for a while and I know how difficult it's been to even get movement. Um, the fact that, you know, maybe we're not 100% where we should be, but I see 50%. Um, so for me, there's incredible excitement that we're making progress and we're making a, a significant impact in this. Um, but, you know, and a lot of it's funding. Um, I do know like on this Project Home Key 2.0, uh, I mean, there are 19 projects from the county, and, and I think there's another, I forget how many from the city, at least another nine projects uh, that have to be open in eight months. That's part of the criteria. They have to be open. Then they're going to roll out 3.0. And so then there's already an, a lot of other projects that are in the queue in the city of Los Angeles. Um, the truth is we can't just snap our fingers and, and have, you know, these, this housing, it, there is a development process, there is tap, you know, the infrastructure that has to be put in place and the finances and the resources. Uh, I mean, even when I read Rick Caruso's, you know, he wanted to put 30,000 beds in the, his first 300 days. Well, that, that's several billions of dollars when you add it up. Um, depending on what methodology you're going to use. I think it's great, but then that, but that also has to be worked out with the city council and, and there's a lot of uh, nuances to make it happen. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, we can't relax. We can't uh, sit back and, 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 you know, pat ourselves on the back. Now is the time to really accelerate our efforts um, and to build on the momentum that we have. Let me ask a quick wanna, a follow wait, up question. Can I, oh, Marianne? Okay, so, I'm only concerned. We've got to ask shorter questions because we want to make sure we have time for Morgan as well. So um, just make right. it short. <laughs> the uh, I, I won't ask my questions again to Morgan. She already knows my questions, so she can <laughs> answer them as she goes along. So, Ken, when people get into a tiny home or one of the other facilities that we have been able to establish, and they have either a mental health issue or a substance abuse, you know, sub, uh, substance issue. Do we have the resources to get, I mean, is that now, is that available or not available to get the, those people, which again, I, I, this is what I read that it's a large percentage of people in this situation have one or both of those concerns. Do we have that going on or do we have them in a bed, but still not have a place to assist yeah. them with those problems? There is not adequate resources as it relates to mental health services and even substance use. Um, you know, we, in all, in all transparency, you know, we link them to mental health and substance use, which just means we connect them, but then getting them to that appointment and making sure that they follow up on it and making sure that they get the detox, making, it's not always happening. And, and often you might say, well, why doesn't the Department of Mental Health have people on site? They don't have the staff and the resources either in order for them to be at every site. I think it should be required that anytime you open up one of these sites, you have to have a multidisciplinary team on site. Um, and, one, and the Trebek Center is a perfect example. We're getting ready to open that up in April. It's 107 beds. But we actually got a foundation, private money, to fund two mental health clinicians full-time on site um, there at the Trebek Center. And I can't wait to see the results of that because when it's, you know, it's a, it's a challenge and it's daunting to get someone to their appointments. And I know the telehealth, we also have a telehealth room, you know, that we're working and trying to streamline that process. But to answer, and I know there's a big push on this also and for more funding for mental health services and substance use, but no, we are not there. All right, let me see if there's another question from, from the group. I see Roz has her hands up and now, now she says she, we can hear her. So that's great. Oh, so can you unmute? Oh, can't hear you. Oh, let me see. Yeah. Are, are you in the phone? You could be in the phone, but it's, it's also muted. Oh, how frustrating. I am so sorry. Well, let's go on. Let's go on to another person. We'll ho hopefully we'll get back to you, Ross. Uh, yes, Bill. I just have a question. Hi, can you hear me now? Oh, okay. Um, go ahead, Ross, and then we'll come yeah, back to you, Bill. I'm sorry, you guys. Technical difficulties in areas okay. of manufacturing, go figure. Um, I'm going to say really quick, Ken, I want to say so, I want to give you so much credit for what you've done, but I know we're short on time, but praise, praise, praise for everything that you and your team have done and, um, you know, putting yourself in that situation, to understand it better, um, I think is just amazing. I, I can't compliment you enough for sure. Um, I have a couple of questions. 
you know, we have some representatives here from the colleges. Um, I know students are going to college to become therapists and psychologists, and I know they have to put in a certain amount of hours in order to get their degree or, or credentials. Um, is there any kind of a handshake that can happen between students um, that are taking courses to, to go into this line of work and working with some of your, these programs and, um, you know, maybe have some kind of a marriage there? Okay, um, so, secondly, so I, I think your question is, I've got to get moving here, so I, sorry about this, but no problem. Yeah, just use, utilizing students who are in the process of being trained. Is that what's happening on that area? Yeah, and we do have some interns already that are working with us. Um, and I know we've been in conversation with Cal State Northridge because like the Trebek Center is right down the street and be able to tap into their, you know, social programs. Um, but, you know, because right now there just is not enough workers either. Even finding the employees that we need, we had a job fair last week, which was great. We had 150 people show up, uh, but finding people that actually have experience and are qualified um, is a bit of a needle in a haystack. And everybody is searching and needing. So we we need like a, an institute that can rapidly teach and and develop people that can jump into this arena because uh, the need is great and we don't have enough. Um, qualified workers at this time. Okay. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the question from Bill, if you can ask it quickly, and then I want to make sure we go on to Morgan. My question is just quickly, um, Are I know the program's new, but are you seeing people transitioning into permanent housing? And then if they are, what, what does that look like? Are they just becoming self-sufficient or is there another step? Yeah, um, we are. And if you want to follow either me personally on social media or Hope of the Valley, it's like almost every day we're posting who's getting housed, housed, housed. And, and, and I think that's important because people want to see, you know, what is the outcome? You know, what is the ROI of my investment? And so, and, and the return on that investment is people that are actually getting housed. And so there's many different programs and oftentimes it could be on a sliding scale on what type of income they have and what they can afford. Um, I know there's been a tremendous amount of housing vouchers that has come from the federal government um, most re recently. And, I, and we have, I think right now, 15 housing navigators. All they do is they're trying to find landlords and they're working with our clients who have housing vouchers to see who will take those vouchers. And then they kind of work out whatever that payment ratio is is and uh, you know and once they're there they're not just left alone there there are housing stabilizers within our um, service provider area that check in on them how are you doing you know how are things going and we even have a lot of the folks that we get permanently housed they're checking back with us and giving reports and if they you know run into some difficulties we help them um, that's why it's nice to have our five thrift stores also that we can tap into our thrift stores for clothing and for for furniture and things like that to help people that are moving uh, out on their own um, but I think to me that's the ultimate goal the goal is not we don't ever want to quote warehouse people. We, it's a continuum of care that starts with outreach and engagement and bringing people indoors, in, uh, interim, bridge, housing, and then moving them into permanent or permanent supportive housing or affordable housing. And then that support system to make sure they don't fall back into homelessness because if they fall back into homelessness, it's just super expensive. And you know, to do that whole that process all over again. And so we want to help them retain their housing. Thank you, Ken. This was awesome. And I know we have many, many more questions we could ask, but I want to give some time to Morgan. So thank you, Morgan. Let me just quickly introduce you as well. Um, Morgan serves as the policy deputy for council member Krikorian, specializing in homelessness policy and also initiatives covering um, economic development and early childhood. She previously served as the field deputy for council district two and specialized in addressing boots in the ground concerns with city homelessness policies in the district, often bringing a field perspective to city hall. So take it away, Morgan. Great, thank you so much, Marianne. And Ken, I, it is very, very daunting to have to follow you, <laughs> for sure. Um, Ken and Hope the Valley have been incredible partners in our, our area of CD2 um, and all over the San Fernando Valley. Um, it's it's really been a blessing to be able to see the work that, that their team has been able to, to achieve um, in such a short amount of time. I don't think I can highlight that enough that um, you know prior to, to my work as policy deputy, I was, um, as Marianne mentioned, field deputy for, for CD2 in the NoHo and Van Nuys areas um, covered by CD2 and working on homelessness, um, boots on the ground. We would, uh, my district director, Lorraine uh, Diaz and I, we would go into to areas where there were many, many 
people experiencing homelessness um, in concentrated areas and, and really trying to, to find out what are the resources that are needed by the individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, and I, I want to take a, a step back really quick because I think that we see the tiny homes and we, see, you know, there's, there's so many of them now, but I think looking back and seeing where we started really movement was not happening for, for emergency beds. You know, everyone was, was really excited about PSH and moving those forward. And that's absolutely critical for our people that are experiencing homelessness, but we also need that emergency response. This is an emer in emergency. We are in a crisis. And just as Ken mentioned, if there was an earthquake, if there was some other type of natural disaster that was happen happening to our city, we would have FEMA beds immediately. We would be able to get people indoors and save from the wind, the cold. And we just didn't see that type of response um, prior to, to really COVID. Um, there, we saw more of an emergency response start to happen when we saw that there was a, a public health emergency. Um, and so we, as, as, a, as a council office, um, council member Krikorian, um, I'm very grateful to, to be policy deputy um, and have, have been served as a field deputy because he is one of the council members that loves new ideas, loves taking on new ideas and seeing how we can make sure that the city of Los Angeles is, is really encouraging new ideas and innovation um, and so one of the first um, things that, that we pushed forward on was the Homeless Navigation Center. So this is, um, again, run by Hope the Valley, and it's really a place for people to, to find a safe space. Um, there's showers, there's um, rooms where they can have a case manager on site, and really just a place to, to kind of settle down and have some quiet. Um, if, if you've ever tried to find quiet on the busy streets of Los Angeles, it's pretty impossible um, unless you are are finding a hidden space in the city and and you really are are by yourself. Um, it's very very difficult to find quiet, to find a moment where your your brain is able to just settle down and stop taking in the noise and start thinking about your next steps. Um, it's nearly impossible to do that. So the homeless navigation center really served that that initial start to all of this. Um, it was opened on March 9th of 2020. So literally just before everything shut down. And it was the perfect timing, I think, for, for our unhoused neighbors um, to be able to say, we have some safe space. I know there's, there's chaos that maybe you're not you're not aware of right now. And, um, and here's this safe space where you can meet with, with some of our case managers, with some of our mental health professionals, um, and get that that safety. Um, and then we did have uh, a number of other housing um, locations open up. We had the first bridge housing in, in the San Fernando Valley that opened up um, with 85 beds. And then we had Van Nuys bridge housing. And then we had our tiny home housing. Um, so we have, I believe it's a total of five um, emergency housing sites. So it's interim housing where people can be able to go indoors, be able to settle, and, and start to really get back to, to thinking about where they want to go next. You know, where, where is the safe place for them to be able to, to get back um, to, to the community? And I think when we're, when we're talking about these housing locations, it is absolutely not the end all be all. Um, and they shouldn't, they shouldn't be seen as that. Um, and council member Kerkorian has been very, very vocal about this. This is not where we end things. These tiny homes are not the end. Um, this is really the start to seeing these solutions and these, these, um, the impact that these housing uh, locations can bring to our communities. When we start to also think about the individuals, right, the, the unhoused individuals, they are part of our communities as well. Um, I think for, for many, many, many decades, we've been thinking about, you know, homelessness as something that was concentrated in a singular location downtown, and that was where homelessness was. And we are now seeing in the San Fernando Valley, I'm a San Fernando Valley longtime resident. I've been here since, you know, since I was little. And, um, and this is, I, I have never seen homelessness um, as I've seen it today. And it is absolutely a part of our community. These individuals, homelessness is, 
a very short, hopefully very short experience for, for individuals. And it should be seen as such. It should see, be seen as an experience and something that people can be lifted up from. Um, and so with these housing um, locations within the San Fernando Valley, we've seen that. We've seen, and, and thank you, Ken, for, for also mentioning that you guys post those stories. I think those are incredibly impactful and necessary to, to see how people are lifting up from homelessness with the help of these of these communities. Um, and then I did want to also mention prevention. I think that's also something that that gets left out of the conversation sometimes because we're seeing the, the effects of, of so many different things that have happened to one person, um, we're seeing that on the street, but we didn't see all of the things that led up to that person experiencing homelessness. And I think there's, there's a lot of work to be done still on the prevention side. That is something that our office is very much committed to, to kind of moving forward on now that we do have the beds, we gotta start making sure that that waterfall of individuals falling into homelessness is being relieved, that we are relieving that waterfall. Um, and so there, there's, um, it's called the Solid Ground Homelessness Prevention Program. Um, this is run through the city. This is at our family source centers. That's one of our prevention programs. Um, they did have a, um, I believe it was the, the council president's office, I think was the one who initiated a, a domestic violence um, pilot to see what kind of impact that could have. Um, if, we, if we focused on one population of, of people experiencing homelessness, what kind of impact does that have making sure that they get the resources that they need before they fall into homelessness? And we saw that 95% of those individuals were able to keep their housing and stay housed. And so those individuals who also had children um, were not falling into homelessness. And those are the types of prevention programs that we need to start encouraging. We need to start funding more, both from the city and county as a partnership. Um, I think that's something that moving forward, Councilmember Kerkorian, our office is very much committed to, to impacting those programs um, a lot more, making sure that we're partnering with our county. Because um, I uh, I just met with the, the GM of our Community Investment and Families Department, Abigail Marquez, um, and she was mentioning the most critical pieces to making sure that those individuals didn't fall back or didn't fall into homelessness in the first place was mental health resources, as well as financial planning, um, setting those goals for themselves with, with a case manager and really working closely with them. Um, so those are, those are, I hope I answered at least some of the questions. Um, one of the last things that I'll mention um, that's also happening at our tiny homes that we're very excited about, we have the LA Rise program. Um, this is where people that are at our tiny homes um, across CD2, they are immediately connected with um, one of our partners, one of our partners to get them started on the job training, soft and hard skills um, for, for jobs, and then getting connected not only to um, that job training, but also getting connected to a job. Um, so they start to kind of feel more like they're a part of their community, the community that they've been living in. Um, and that's, I think, what we're trying to, to do with these communities, making sure that we start to see everybody as part of our community and uplifting everyone um, after, after all they've been through. So. Um, Hopefully that, that answers a lot of the, the questions that were asked, but happy to, to answer any questions you may have now. Thank you, Morgan. I see there's one in the, uh, in the chat and why don't I start with that one from um, Scott Silverstein. Appreciate what you do for them. How's there are two hotels being converted to homeless facilities immediately across the street from Taft High School in Woodland Hills. Other shelter leaders have said that this is a bad place to put the facilities since some of the unhoused may be uh, mentally unstable. What is your position on this? as outside your district, but in general, uh, if, in this kind of scenario, uh, what is, uh, aren't these facilities putting the 2,500 students at undue risk? So maybe you can respond. Yeah, so um, so it's, it's always, um, you know, tough to think of these locations being in your backyard or right down the street from a school. Um, but my question would then be, 
where were people experiencing homelessness before they were being housed at these locations? And I think that's that's kind of where we start to remember, okay, they were right under the overpass across the street from Taft High School. I take that commute all the time um, and I do have friends that live right there. Um, and that there were a number of people that were at that underpass if, if there aren't still individuals at that underpass. Um, and so it's it can be really, really tough. Um, but I, what I would say is working with your, your council office working with the the field deputies for that area um, can be really helpful to to start to say hey these are the concerns that we have how are we going to work together to make sure that those concerns don't turn into real problems um, you know i think there's a there's a real concern always about individuals like coming from other areas other parts of the valley that didn't live here before and making sure we are all a part of this community. And I think the only way that, that we can start to, to uplift and strengthen our community by seeing these individuals as really, really viable parts of our community is by seeing what can happen with, with making sure that these people have a safe place to go. Um, and so, so one way that we were able to, to work with our communities around our bridge homes and around our tiny homes was making sure that we have, we're working with sanitation to have regular cleanups around the area. Um, with that increased sanitation means we also have increased outreach. So the teams, when they go to an encampment location that may be right down the street from one of our bridge housing sites, they're able to immediately interact with people that are at that encampment, be able to offer them a bed because there are open beds now and be able to, to start working with them. It doesn't happen immediately. Some people have been experiencing homelessness for 10 plus years. And so their trust has been broken by the system. And so sometimes it does take some time to, to get people, you know, encouraged enough to want to go indoors. Um, but I think that there's, there's a lot of movement now that I don't see those how, as long as we're working together, I think once, once we start to work together and you start to express your concerns to your representatives, that is where you'll start to see that, that solutions can be found. And can I understand, somebody left a note here that um, that you are, Hope of the Valley is actually operating or, or developing those particular hotels near Taft High School, is that correct? Uh, well, one in particular, the 818 Hotel, we are in escrow right now with the county in a joint application to the state. And and, and I know there's been some concern and I've spoke with the, uh, the person who heads the Woodland Hills Homeowners Association and after our conversation, he felt much better. Uh, but it's gonna be families. And if you're gonna have any population in a shelter near you, families are the best. We operate three family shelters and we've had zero issues. Uh, and, and people don't even know that they're there. And oftentimes people that are in families that are experiencing homelessness, I mean, they follow the rules. They wanna end their homelessness. They wanna get back into a place for, the, for safety for them and their children. And to me, these it's a great location. The rooms are large. Each one has their own bathroom. On site will be all the supportive services and food services. It will be interim housing. And then right next door, the city is applying um, at the extended stay for it to be um, under Councilman Bloomingfield's um, office, for it to be for seniors. I mean, talk about the two best populations you could possibly have in a community. Now, I mean, and I know because we operate, you know, for single adults, and oftentimes with the single adults, you're having much more intensive issues. Um, and so, in you know, people, I've already we've talked to the principal of Taft and, and, and making sure that they understand. But again, the reality is, is these these projects have not been determined. Um, the state is considering whether or not they will get behind them with Project Home Key 2.0. I'm hoping that they do, um, and I will be speaking on the, uh, the Woodland Hills Homeowners Association um, call next week, um, and I hope that you know, we can really uh, look at it with facts, and uh, honestly, I think it'd be the best thing that could, that could happen. Great. All right. Um, one last question. It has to be a quick question, please. <laughs> Be concise if there's one more question. Question, and, and Morgan kind of touched on it at the end, but my question was just around, you know, you hear in the media that it's hard to get homeless people to go into shelters and that they don't want to go, they want to stay. So I guess how much of that is really factual versus, you know, kind of excuse for why things aren't happening? Yeah, no, and I, I think that's a that's a great question, and it's one of the concerns, right? If, if we're going to have all of these resources and people don't want to go inside, 
what's the point of wanting to, to push for these resources? And, and it was like I said earlier that there are some people that have been experiencing homelessness <clears throat> and really had their trust broken by the system. And it's our, it's really our job now to start to, to quell those fears and, and to start to remind everyone that you are just as important in this community and a, being a part of this community as much as the next guy. And, and we wanna make sure that we're uplifting um, individuals that, that have had that trust broken. So so that they feel one, you know, they feel like this is going to be part of their their steps away from homeless of experiencing homelessness. That they are going to be uplifted, um, and then be part really really strong parts of of the recovery efforts. I think moving out of of COVID and everything that that everyone has experienced on health, mental, and you know spiritual that that we can all start to see each other as as parts of of the recovery here. Um, so really excited to, to kind of see the, the efforts that can be made by groups like yourself. I think VEA is a very, very strong part of this. Our small business communities, our, our communities within the San Fernando Valley, we've got that strength to be uplifted from all of this. And that includes homelessness. Great. Well, thank you so much, Morgan. Thank you so much, Ken. One additional comment. I know that Ken has said this to me and other homeless providers that now, um, with these opportunities for tiny homes and other possibilities, typically, as I understand it, you all are, are getting people from the immediate neighborhoods around that facility to live there because often they have friends and that's an important part of their mental health is to stay together as a group when they move into whatever housing uh, situation is being offered to them. So um, rather than shipping them across town to another part of, of the city. So at any rate, just something else to keep in mind. Um, and, and also just finding locations. It's never gonna be a perfect location. I mean, I, I know some of your tiny home villages are right on the freeway, which is great. It's little slivers of land that you know nobody's bothered by and, and so on and so forth. But it's also environmentally not that healthy of a place for someone to live permanently. And as you said, you want to move them on to permanent housing. But at any rate, it's kind of what's become available. And we just need to realize that we need to have these properties all over LA um, if we're really going to solve the problem. We can't just, as some people have suggested to me, we can't just ship everybody out to Lancaster, you know, and hope the problem goes away. 60,000 people going out to Lancaster doesn't really work, you know. So, so we, we need to be aware of that and kind of educate our NIMBY friends about, you know, would you rather have people, you know, the unhoused across the street from the high school living on the, on the street, or would you rather have them in shelter where they're getting supervision and support and three meals a day and all those good services that are being provided by the services um, that Hope of the Valley and others in your district are, are providing. So thank you very, very much. This is a very inspiring day. Thanks to all of you who came and joined us. We hope you'll come back next month as well. Um, any other final comments, um, um, Sonia? No, ma'am, that covers it. Just uh, really want to thank Ken and Morgan again and um, just encourage everyone to check out in the chat some of the activities that Ken's involved with. Um, this uh, Death to Hope uh, marathon that he's going to be doing sounds amazing. And you are, there are ways for us to go along with him by contributing um, uh, in some way and sharing the word about it so we can all be a part of that. And then we are so happy to be honoring Ken at our Valley of the Stars Gala on April 8th and encourage you all to celebrate with us and information's in the chat about that as well. Um, that's about it, Marianne. Thank you okay. so much. And next month we're gonna be having, we were working on a second speaker, but we know for sure that um, Al Grazioli who heads up real estate for LUSD is gonna be sharing with us about some of their plans to build workforce housing for their teachers and school nurses and so on on school properties. And that's one of our areas of emphasis for our Housing Creates Communities campaign is really building up more of that kind of middle income kind of housing because when those people are housed, it opens up other housing for those that are um, probably not as well established in terms of their finances and so on and so forth. So there's a need for both affordable as well as middle income housing. All right, thank you very much and uh, have a good day. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. Take care, bye-bye. Thank you again, take care.